we're starting off with uh, Aaron Kachuk, who is coming to us from Belgium, from his new residence in Belgium, as he's been telling us all about that. So congratulations on surviving the move. And Thank he's you. going to, yes, of course, and he's going to talk to us about the inner life of things in Virgil's Aeneid. Well, uh, Aaron, take it away. Thank you very much, Adrian. Thank you, Chiara. Thank you, everyone. And again, my apologies. Uh, and, and, and mostly, I'm just very sorry for myself for having missed all of the incredible sounding and looking papers from the last couple of days. And it was very exciting to see the handouts that were available. And I'll look forward to seeing the, the papers as they pop up online. Um, but at any rate, um, I'm very happy to be here with you all today. I'm just going to share my screen with you. First apology is that the, the slides will be in French. Um, because although I had time to rewrite the, the text of the paper from, um, from French into English, I didn't have time to redo during the move the, the PowerPoint presentation. So my apologies and also for the odd infelicity in the translation, which I had to do somewhat quickly um, without further ado. In his poetics, Aristotle describes the best kind of plot as one that causes fear and pity, and he sees such emotional responses linked to what he describes as amazement. As it turns out, the best way to cause amazement is through occurrences that are at the same time unexpected, but still part of a clear causal sequence. As an example of such a plot, he refers to the story of how at Argos, the statue of a man named Mytis killed the man who caused Mytis's death by falling on him on a festival. As D.H. Roberts puts it, this kind of story is praiseworthy in part because, quote, it follows in likely sequence, or at least in the semblance of likely sequence, even though it cannot be explained in purely human terms. As de Frede puts it, there is at least the semblance here that it did not happen by mere chance. Thus, Aristotle concludes that, quote, such events do not seem to be mere accidents, so such plots as these must necessarily be the best. My goal in today's paper will be to examine to what extent the structure of Virgil's Aeneid might be said to exemplify this best kind of plot and the possible role of vengeful objects within it. More precisely, I present here a new interpretation of the structure of Virgil's poem from books one to book 12 as the story of things and ultimately their inner lives. My endpoint will be an analysis of how the Baldric of the dead youth palace provokes Aeneas's rage in the poem's conclusion. What is the status? What the role of this Baldric? Is it only in Virgil's words a memorial of terrible pain or does it play some more active part in the poem's denouement or rather surprise peroration? Now, the longer version of this paper approaches this question in three parts, beginning with an investigation to the development of the idea of the genius rei, the genius of things, in Servius Danielis's adaptation of Vero, Various Flaccus, and Ophustius to a reading of Virgil's Georgics. The end result of this investigation is somewhat negative. Um, it's that while Virgil clearly had the cult of genius as part of his poetic thesaurus, it's not at all clear that the formal term itself is most apposite to the study of his poetry. Instead, as I suggest, we need to obey the dictum of Charles Brink, that the prudent and highly institutional approach to matters of cult and appellation on the part of Augustus and his advisors is scarcely on a par with the poetic expressions of volitions, emotions, and hopes. Thus, to understand this question of the inner life of objects in Virgil's poetry, parts two and three of this paper, which we'll hear today, turn from explicit to implicit theology, to the adaptation, that is, of the rhythms of cult to poetic form. First, I'll show how two overlapping and interconnected series of object exchanges help structure the Aeneid as a whole, from Aeneas's gifts to Dido in Book 1 to Aeneas's burial of Pallas in Book 11, then from Pallas's death at the end of Book 10 to Turnus's death in the last lines of the poem. In today's second part, part three of the full paper, I look at how these object exchanges describe a trajectory from inert objects to objects full of feeling and agency, or we might say genius, genius with a special case of Pallas's Baldric prepared both by the apparition of the Penates in Book 3 and of the Adionyms in Book 9, as well as by the progression of apparently ingenious objects in Book 12. The story of the Aeneid is the story of the life of objects. The poem famously breaks with tradition by opening with a word for objects, arma. And had we time, we might follow the fate of these arma along with the phrase arma virumque itself, uh, which, as Pierre Magor has recently shown, becomes in Virgil's hand a kind of potent traveling object with a life of its own throughout the poem. For us, it's only important now to note that the poem's opening interest in objects and the entanglement of objects with humans becomes part and parcel of the structure of the poem as a whole through a series of object exchanges that begin in the poem's first book 
and through an evolution culminating book 12 from objects subject to exchange to objects affecting change. In comparative contexts, object exchange has proved a fruitful tool for the study of epic, most notably in the studies of the Beowulf poem. But we need not go so far as that. Homer's Iliad is fundamentally an exploration of a crisis in the heroic economy described by two consecutive story arcs. In the first, Agamemnon loses Chryseis, steals Briseis from Achilles to make good his loss. Achilles rejects compensation offered through the embassy in Book 9, only to accept such compensation following Patroclus' death and his decision to return to combat to kill Hector. Achilles does kill Hector, who is incidentally wearing the armor of Achilles that Patroclus had worn to battle with his armor thus restored to Achilles. The death of Hector initiates the epic's second object loop, this time focused on the corpse of Hector. Achilles' eventual yielding of the body to Priam represents a successful model of supplication and thus symbolizes the restoration of a normal heroic economy to the world of the poem. Objects do not abound in Virgil's poem in the same way as in the Beowulf poem or in Homer, nor do they return as repetitiously, but as Richard Heinze long ago pointed out, brevity is one of Virgil's most important tools. And as we shall see, Virgil adapts Homer's consecutive and interlinked plots of object exchange to the special needs of his own poem. Like Homer, this takes the form of two interlinked plots. Now, the first of these plots begins in Carthage. Having met Aeneas and welcomed him to her kingdom, Dido sends to the Trojan ships a consignment of livestock comprised of 20 bulls, 100 of her largest pigs, 100 fat lambs, and an equal number of ewes, as well as wine. In exchange, Aeneas tasks Acates with bringing Ascanius to Dido's palace, along with gifts for Dido, the first of which you can see on the screen in front of you, which I shan't read out. But the most important of the objects for our purposes is that palla is that uh, that mantle um, which you can see bolded on the screen. A translatio imperii is in fact enacted here. Gifts from Leda, the mortal consort of Zeus, mother to Helen, Clytemnestra, and the Dioscuri, made their way first to Troy, only to be saved from the fall of Troy by Aeneas and given to Dido. The first of these gifts is the palla, a mantle the other a velamen, a veil. In the end, it is not Ascanius, but Cupid, Aeneas's brother, so Ascanius's ever young uncle, who comes in the guise of Ascanius to bring these gifts to Dido's court. In this, Cupid follows the instructions of his mother, Venus, who had pointed precisely to these gifts. And in the end, it is both the divine boy and the objects that inflame Dido in equal parts. As the poet says at the very bottom of the screen, as you can see, et pariter puero donisque muetur. Now, unless the, the line is to be removed, as some have argued, the pala and the velamen make another appearance right here, and you can see that, um, which is bracketed right there. Aeneas has thus given two articles of clothing to Dido, the pala with its gold, the velamen with its yellow dye, and he will in turn receive gifts of clothing in return. This counter gift comes before our eyes, focalized through the vision of Mercury who was sent by Jupiter to hurry Aeneas to return to sea. To leave Carthage for Italy, Dido uh, for, as he will later discover, Lavinia. When Mercury finds Aeneas, the hero is wearing a special cloak called a lina. And I won't uh, read this out in, in any detail, but you have it there before you. Now, this is the only appearance of the word lina in the poem, a particular kind of gown uh, and a recent article by Llewellyn Morgan has vigorously defended Servius's identification of this lina as the Flamen's special robe. I have much to say about this, but not at the moment. No one in fact find out later, until later in the poem, that Dido has in fact made at least one other cloak for Aeneas. When describing the funeral arrangements for Pallas in Book 11, Virgil repeats from Book 4 words to describe Dido's personal crafting of these cloaks. And you see that here in Book 11. We have these twin cloaks um, that Aeneas brings forward that were ipsa suis condomini Sidonia Dido, that Dido herself had made with her own very hands, et tenui telas discrevit aro, and she had actually woven in these, these woven bits of, of, of uh, there with, with delicate gold fashioning, um, repeating a line from earlier in his poem. Like the line, these garments combine gold and the color purple. Virgil repre repeats himself verbatim, a rare occurrence, in describing them as Dido's own handicraft. And the description of Dido 
as having been Lita, happy with her work, may itself recall the gift that we'd earlier heard name, the Lina. Dido's own happiness at her work, Lita, at any rate, is meant to contrast with Aeneas's being sad, maestus, when he employs one of these robes to cover the corpse of Pallas. It's noteworthy that Lita and maestus are in the same sedes, thus bringing Dido and Aeneas once again, perhaps for the last time, in conversation, in an identification, the one with the other. Was the line of one of these two coats? The overlap of the color schemes might lead us to think so. The description of these twin cloaks being made stiff with gold certainly does. These twin coats and the lina are the only fabric items in the poem to be so described, with the word otherwise only applied to the lorica, or the breastplate that Venus gives Aeneas in Book 8. Although Virgil says that Aeneas used one of the two robes to cover the body of Pallas, he leaves unspoken the material used to clothe Pallas's head, and so it has seemed probable to many commentators that the second of these cloaks is used at this point. This double use, in turn, as well as the awkwardness surrounding it, Virgil inherited from the case of Hector's disappearing funereal cloak, which I can discuss if we have time later. In any event, with this act of burial, the first exchange loop of the poem is closed. And with a wordplay or word echo of structural importance that is typical of Virgil's method. Apala goes from Lida to Helen in Greece, to Aeneas in Troy, finally to Dido in Carthage, who uses it as her funeral clothes after exchanging it for cloaks that Aeneas will use to bury Pallas in Italy. From Palla to Pallas, that is. And if one wanted evidence that such a word association was possible, one might turn to the fact that Varro derives the Palla in Latin from the Greek verb palain, to shake or quiver, for that cloaks appearance and movement, while Servius derives the name Pallas for the goddess Athena from the same Greek verb ad pastai concussione, from the shaking of his spear. And we'll pass for now by the Apollonian and Homeric heritage of Virgil's Palla of Lita. And sorry, that's these are the various etymological tidbits uh, which you can find on, on the handout that, that's available online of the word Pala. Thus is the exchange of garments brought to a funereal close. But as with Homer's Iliad, this object ring gives way to another shorter loop that helps bring the poem to a close. In the Iliad, these rings are successive, in the Aeneid overlapping, for with the death of Pallas, which allows for the closing of one loop, another object sequence is initiated. When that spans from the death of Pallas to the death of Turnus in the poem's opening lines, that object is the Balteus, the Baldric of Pallas. And just as Aeneas's line seemed to burn our day by Mercury, so too, this object, the Balteus, will be a flame fulgentia and will stoke the flames of rage that bring the poem to a close. Virgil makes this object ring especially easy to close and predict by stepping into the poem himself in these famous lines as, Pal as Turnus steals the, the, uh, the, the baldric from, uh, from Pallas. Nescia mens hominum, O oh, mind of men, oh, holy, uh, an unknowing of its fate and of its future fortune. Um, and Turnus obviously will learn one day to rue his taking of this baldric. We'll come to the concluding scene where the Balteus fulfills its destiny, setting Aeneas on fire to kill Turnus. But to understand that scene's importance, we must first grasp the role of objects in the 12th book as a whole, and we must first go back to another object involved with inflaming passions. Now, towards the book's opening, Turnus makes the poem's most notable address to an object. Where others pray to gods in order to help guide their aim, Turnus prays to his spear itself. The spear occupies a key role in his household, standing leaned against a column in the middle of his halls. In its location, uh, it resembles the huge altar of Priam beneath the open heaven and the ancient laurel tree that stood next to it. It resembles, too, the only other use of the phrase Aedibus in Medis in the Aeneid, the early morning conversation between Aeneas, Achates, Evander, and Pallas on the site of the Palatine. It is a formula, then, that takes us from Troy to Aeneas's love for Pallas to Turnus's final day. When he encounters the spear, Turnus's prayer suggests that the Italian hero makes a habit of calling upon the spear, perhaps not only figuratively, nunc o nuncum frustrata vocatus hasta meos. Like the Balteus of Pallas, the spear was taken by Turnus as spolium, this time from Actor of Arunca, a town in Campania. The spear was captured in previous conflict, but it is as though Turnus recaptures it every time he takes it up. Validam vi corripit hastam. Virgil writes, he grasped the spear by force. 
In fact, it's the only weapon that is taken hold of by force in the poem, with the notable exception of the goddess Eris sent by Juno to encourage the Trojan women to burn the fleet, who grabs hold with violence of deadly flame before launching it towards the ship. The violence of the spear's capture is thus replayed with every taking up of the spear by Turnus. He prays to the spear, but he treats it ferociously. Indeed, in this Dustil hymn, Turnus reminds the spear of its history. Great actor, well did you, now the right hand of Turnus bears you. And asks it to lay low the semi weary Frigi, the Phrygian eunuchs with the phallic association of spears, so clearly demonstrated by John Adam, perhaps resonant in the slur. Taking up the spear by force and making his prayer to the spear seem to have a particular effect on Turnus that looks forward to the end of the poem. Hic agitur furri is, to toque ardentis ab ores scintilab sistunt, oculis magit acribus igni. So he's really on fire and frenzied um, as a result of the taking up of the spear, either as a result of or consequently from it. And the subsequent comparison of Turnus to the angered bull looks directly to forward to the consecutive spear throws of Aeneas and Turnus in their great duel later in the book. Those two heroes there are compared to tall two bulls facing one another on mighty Sela or on Tiburnus's heights. It's therefore when he takes up his spear that he becomes the bull who is to fight this book's final fight. The description of Turnus aflame looks backwards to the moment in book seven when Elicto fixes a fiery brand sub pectora under the chest of Turnus, thus transforming him from a reasonable prince into a warrior aflame with rage. It also, as we shall see, looks forward to the end of the book, where another object will similarly inflame the passions of Turnus's enemy, Aeneas, leading to Turnus's death. Now, why does Virgil pay so much attention to Turnus's spear, to Turnus's prayer to the spear, to the spear's association with the reignition of Turnus's flames of rage? This spear makes no further appearance in the book. When Turnus does at last get a chance to throw a spear at Aeneas, it misses and occupies the space of only one line, pro curso rapido conientis eminus hastis. That's in line 7, 11. The weapon that does get some attention during Turnus's final battle, however, was mentioned just prior to Turnus's prayer to his battle one spear, the sword that the god of fire had made for his father Daunus and had doused in the waters of the river Styx. This, then, is a truly magical sword. Like Aeneas's armor, it is made by the god Vulcan is made invulnerable through magical means and belongs, as it were, to Turnus's family with good Italian roots. Why does Turnus pray to the spear of Actor and not to his father's sword? We can only speculate, but the sword, either in its presence or absence, plays a truly fateful role in the book. When Turnus and Aeneas do finally fight at close quarters, Turnus succeeds in striking Aeneas with his sword, but what should have been a fatal blow turns out to be nothing of the sword, for the blade Turnus held turned out to be treacherous perfuse. How so? Virgil, it seems, does not know for certain, but he relates a story told by Fama by rumor that the sword might not have been Daunus' sword at all, but that of Turnus's charioteer, which Turnus had mistakenly grabbed in haste with his father's sword left behind, Patrio Mucrone Relicto. It has not been noticed, though, that this represents a pattern of neglect on Turnus's part. As we have seen, Turnus addresses his special attention not to the sword that had been gifted from his father, but instead to the spear he had won in combat a spear with which he reenacts the violence of capture and through which reher ritual rehearsal he inflames himself or is inflamed towards further violence. Now, as it turns out, while Virgil lavished attention on Turnus's encounter with his spear only for it to play a minor role, there is in fact another spear in the book that while not addressed, turns out to be especially potent and to obey very special rules of physics all its own, the spear of Aeneas. After Turnus's sword breaks, he flees from Aeneas, leading to them making a circuit around the city five times. At this point, they pause where Aeneas' spear had lodged itself in the earth in what turns out to have been a grove sacred to Faunus. Turnus prays to Faunus to prevent Aeneas from reclaiming his spear. Faunus grants his wish, but when Turnus brings a new sword to Turnus, Venus intervenes and plucks the sword from its deep root. Turnus stands with his sword, Aeneas with his spear, but following the long colloquy between Jupiter and Juno that reconciles them one to the other and decides the Italian's fate, Turnus decides in the first instance to throw a stone at Aeneas. The stone misses. Aeneas, in turn, throws a spear at Turnus. This, though, is the spear that bears with it horrible death. We're told that it flies like a black hurricane, volat atri turbinis instar, and the whirling motion suggested by this similitude is in fact more literal than figurative. The spear, Virgil writes, breaks through the breastplate of Turnus and the edge of his shield and then his femur. How does a spear pass first through a breastplate, a loricum, and then through a shield, only then to strike the femur? 
And commentators who wish to remove the mystery call this a proteron pusteron construction, or suggest that the order is determined matrix causa. Yet this would be to ignore the comparison of Aeneas' spear to a turbo, defined by Seneca the Younger as a wind revolving and passing around the same spot and gathering momentum by its very rotation. For its circular motion, one could indeed look back to the madness of Queen Amata, compared by Virgil in her madness to a spinning top, that is, to a turbo. Might the spear have some of the qualities that Turnus had prayed to his own spear to evince? Might it have the kind of life of its own that one finds, for example, in the magic spear of Cephalus in the seventh book of Ovid's Metamorphoses, which actually returns to its caster? Did Turnus's spear cast fail him out of fondness for its old master, Actor, and out of bad feelings over the unorthodox violence with which Turnus took hold of it? If rumor is wrong and Turnus took the correct sword, then did it break because he prayed not to his patrimony, but to his father? If, sorry, to his, to, to his spear. If rumor is right and Turnus took the wrong sword, did he fail to take the wrong sword similarly because his mind was otherwise occupied? Finally, did Aeneas' spear take on a life of its own, moving through a space in a way unlike any other ballistic objects in the poem? Does the 12th book of the poem, that is, show us objects with a life of their own, with a dunamis, a genius, proper to themselves? Such intimations towards this idea as do exist moves us inexorably to the last lines of the poem. There, in that final scene, Aeneas' wrath is kindled, not when, like Turnus, he violently takes hold of an object, but when he beholds one. Not a spear, but the Balteus, the baldric of the boy, Pallas, killed and stripped by Turnus in Book 10. Here, at last, the interconnected object exchange plots of the poem come to an end. Recall, Aeneas' palla was compensated with gowns used to bury Pallas. But now the ornament stripped from Pallas's body will, like Aristotle's statue of Mytis, participate in the death of the murdered man's killer. A balteus, to remind, is a kind of strap generally worn over the shoulder from which a sword or quiver could be hung, and which could be decorated by engraved images as well as by circular gold pieces called bulai. Now, one might be forgiven for thinking of the balteus as something of a banality in a poem replete with armor, instruments of war, and various accoutrements of fashionable bellicosity. In fact, however, there are, properly speaking, only three balte in the poem. One is a prize briefly mentioned in Book 5 as a prize that Aeneas announces for the foot race, the other worn by the first victim of the renewed combats in Book 12. A balteus thus oversees the debut and the end of the final book's combats. But turning to that final balteus, the end of the poem finds Aeneas standing over the vanquished and submissive Turnus. As Turnus has hesitated before being struck by Aeneas' magic spear, so too Aeneas famously now hesitates on the brink of following his father's advice to spare the vanquished foe. He's ready to do so, but then the second object exchange of the poem comes to fruition, bringing the poem to its ending that both optimistic and pessimistic readers of the poem find unprecedented in its violence. And I shan't read the end of the poem, which I'm sure we all know well. It is only when this Balteus, this object appears that Aeneas is set aflame with the same furies that had touched Turnus after himself had grasped, shook, and prayed to the spear of a Runkian actor. It is significant, therefore, that when this baldric appears, parts of it are aflame, full salient. It is upon seeing the full gore shot forth by this object that Aeneas himself becomes inflamed, as Turnus had by his own spear. Aeneas is now aflame with his furies, Furi Isa Kensus, is boiling over, fair vidus, enough to violate his father's orders. Now, why does the Balteus have this effect on Aeneas? Here, what has been called Virgil's subjective style, his tendency to focalize our view through that of the characters involved, is of assistance, for we're seeing this end through Aeneas' eyes. While it is the Balteus that appears, it is the belt attached to it that flickers with the recognizable pendants of Pallas the boy. Why should Aeneas focus on these bullae, on these studs? Why should these be what in particular he recognizes rather than the Balteus or the Kingula itself? Why should these bullae play so crucial a role in the flaming brilliance that inflames Aeneas' own spirit and leads to Aeneas' avowed collaboration with the dead palace in Turnus' death? Virgil gives us a clue through his enjambment. These notai bullae belong to the boy palace. This collocation recently led Andrea Cucchiarelli to hear in these words an allusion to the object worn by well-born Roman boys. The bulla, a circular pendant presented to a well-born boy at his birth, worn as a necklace throughout his childhood, then presented to the Larf Familiaris when he entered manhood and took up his toga realis, just as a girl would dedicate to that same Larf her dolls. Indeed, the bulla itself could be inscribed with the name of its bearer. Might these well-known bulla 
also be engraved with notis, that is with letters spelling out the name Pallas, the name that Aeneas will cry out repeatedly as he kills Turnus. I'm not saying that these bullae are precisely a bulla, and indeed the plural use for the bulla's amulet would be otherwise unattested. But what I'm saying is that the emphasis on Pallas's boyhood, as well as his embodied presence at the poem's end, might seem to suggest that one might hear that Aeneas might see the personal bulla behind these bullae, and that the work of the Balteus and its bullae might be related to the remarkable, well-prepared, but also unprecedented active role that this object plays in the conclusion of this poem. In fact, we can take the role of this bulla one step further in a way that unites this paper's many intertwined interests in the cult of the genus, in object exchanges, in the structure of the Aeneid, and in the possible agency of objects themselves. According to Festus, the bulla was meant to hang on the boy's chest, on his pectus, as a reminder of the importance of bulle, concilium, whose natural seat is in the chest, the pectus. As fanciful as this etymology might seem, Plutarch repeatedly refers it to Varro. It is therefore worth observing that Turnus killed Pallas precisely by piercing his chest, and that Aeneas in turn, inflamed by the fulgor of Pallas' Balteus, kills Turnus by planting his sword, sub pectora. Now, it is easy to pass over this phrase, sub pectora, as a banality, but in fact, it is anything but that. In fact, it is only here that Virgil uses this phrase to refer to a physical wound, or indeed to a corporeal human body part. Elsewhere in Virgil's poem, it refers to divine inspiration, to wounded pride, to love, but with the exception of a ship prow on the sea, it never refers to a human body. As usual, Virgil creates a symmetry. Turgil had, Turnus had himself been struck once sub pectora by the fiery torches of Electo, at least in the realm of dreams, or one might say, of the spirit. Now, though, we believe we are to take it as a physical wound, and it is that, of course, but is it only that? Now, recall that while Aeneas is the one who, in the poet's description, buries the sword sub pectora, he is not, according to himself, the agent of this sacrifice. No, that role Aeneas attributes to Pallas, for it is Pallas who immolat, who casts the mola salsa that designates Turnus as a sacrificial victim in preparation for the butchery, whether by the presiding priest or his agent, a story I tell in more detail in an upcoming work on the role of the goddess Vesta in Latin poetry. Now, we often see Aeneas's invocation in Pallas as a rhetorical gesture, but what if we were to take it more seriously? Might we see here, as elsewhere in the poem, a double action, one that takes place both in the human and the divine realm simultaneously? One thinks, for example, of those images on the walls of Pompeii, where a man's genius is shown giving offerings to the lares. When a man sacrifices to a lares on the human realm, does a genius do so simultaneously in a way invisible to our mortal eyes? That is to say, as Aeneas stabs Turnus, does he stab him sub pectore precisely because this is the death that is enacted both on the human realm by Aeneas and on the divine realm by Pallas? which is to say that Pallas is present in the bullae that provoked Aeneas in the first place. Is Pallas not only a memory, but also an agent in this final scene? Pallas is embodied in the object that came into being as Pallas himself did, the bulla given to him on his dies natales, on his birthday day, and therefore coterminous with his genius, the spirit born within and that dies with us, only to survive here, perhaps, in the genius rei, in the spirit of an object, so such as to say, an object that not only reminds, but also perhaps remembers its own past. If this is so, then the Baldrick joins a cast of other characters, the objects in the poem that humans think that they carry, but that in fact seem to be characterized, as Aristotle would say, of animals by self-motion. Had we more time together, I would show how this is the case with the Trojan horse, horse with Aeneas's fleet. But to conclude, let me just say a brief word about the other major object loop of the poem, that of the penates, which provides a prototype for the Balteus as acting object, and with the bulla shares a relationship with the hearth of home and city. The poem of the poem already speaks of how Aeneas is the bare gods in the Latium, referring to the penates, and Juno complains to Iolus of exactly this, that Aeneas is bearing defeated penates into Italy. Aeneas introduces himself to Dido as pious Aeneas, I who carry with me in my ships, the penate snatched from the foe. And yet in book three, the plot thickens. Aeneas has a vision of the sacred images of the gods and of the Phrygian penates that I snatched from the flames and brought to Troy. There's already a double determination in the apposition presenting Aeneas's description here. They're both effigies of the god and the gods themselves, both objects and divinities. And this double determination is very apposite. For where Aeneas believes himself to be carrying objects, ex tuleram, these objects believe that they are doing 
the moving. Nos te dar Daniel Kensa Twakwe Arma Sekuti. We followed you. We measured out the far sea um, uh, upon your ships. To Aeneas they are carried. To themselves in this apparition they follow. If the Penates are both carried and carriers, if the tree nymphs of Ida live on in Aeneas's ships, if the Trojan horse is both constructed mechanism and organic self mover, if Pallas's baldric can bring to an end the object exchanges that I have shown structure this poem and its translations of epic and empire from beginning to end, then to answer this paper's opening question, Virgil's epic turns out to exemplify Aristotle's dictum perfectly. As the Stegarian put it, such events do not seem to be mere accidents. So such plots as these must necessarily be best. When the poem promised us arma virunque, arms in a man, how could we have guessed that the ending would give us so unexpected a twist on this? Arma pueri virunque, we might say, the arms of a boy and of a man, with that boy's arms exercising over that man, some force of suasion the likes of which break even his virtuous hesitation. It is in the end the arma that decide this poem's end just as they had launched its unexpected and wholly irregular beginning. To sum up then, this paper has proposed that objects play a key role in the structure of the Aeneid, and that objects in that poem can take on a life of their own in the poem's imaginary, and that certain aspects of Roman cult, especially those concerning the cult of Ganeus and related household cults of the Larfa Miliaris, might play a role in these structures and associations. We have, of course, many more questions to answer, and this paper only scratches the surface. What does it mean the scholar of religion can ask for Romans to legally, ritually, and phenomenologically inhabit what Keith Hopkins called a world full of gods, we might say, a world crammed with gods? How, we scholars of literature might ask, can ritual inform literature? Can poetry find inspiration in the rhythms of cult? How, that is, can a more sensitive anthropology of Roman culture be put into dialogue with an analysis of the idiosyncratic poetic theologies or theological poetics of the Latin literary imaginary and on the granular level of textual interpretation. On the level of the Aeneid itself, what would it mean to study this question on a more exhaustive level across the broad spectrum of objects used, viewed, and exchanged in the poem? On the level of the Baldric itself, what role does its iconography, its impressionethas, play in the story that I've here tried to reveal? How can the work of the entanglement of objects and humans in anthropology by Carlos Severi, or in Greek literature and art by, for example, François Lissara, Gilet Geifman, Verity Platt, and others be put into conversation with work on Roman literature. All of this work is for the future. And for now, I'm very eager well, to, to hear the papers to come and to discuss these and many other questions with you all. Thank you very much for listening.